Marta, but if you can do Marta, Marta correctly. So I would like to know what kind of impact they had on South American population on the on their political and religious everything. Yeah. Um, well, you know, like I said, they in Brazil, um, some of the earliest slave revolts were led by Muslims. And as a result of that, uh, the uh, governments, the Portuguese and the Spanish, began to pass edicts outlawing the importation of Muslims specifically as slaves, because they proved to be too troublesome uh, to, to enslave. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, and there was there was a much um, greater drive at conversion uh, in South America and in the Caribbean. But even with that, there was significant um, what we call syncretism or kind of uh, borrowing of different cultures to create this. So in in uh, Santeria practices, there are remnants of, of Islam uh, in, uh, in Cuba and in uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, there are, um, you know, several kinds of practices that survive, uh, but become kind of part of a creolized culture. So it's it's a little bit harder to unpack um, than you know than, than in, in other parts, but it is there, um, and, and it has kind of continued through. I mean, there there's a whole like growing movement of Latino Muslims, and many of them trace uh, uh, their identity through um, both the African Muslims who were brought as slaves and the Moors uh, who settled the New World. Because in 1492, not only is that a remarkable date for when you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but it's also a date when the Jews uh, and Muslims were kicked out of Spain as part of the, the Spanish uh, Inquisition, right? Um, and the, the, the Moriscos, who were the Muslims, or the Moors, and the Morenos, who were the Jews, many of them traveled to the New World um, and settled, uh, but masked their, their identity in order to stay in those societies. Um, so you have a lot of Latino Muslims who are engaging in the same kind of historical recovery, and they're looking at the tradition of African Muslims as well as the Moors uh, in, uh, in Spain and Mexico. Mexico had a large Arab population, both as part of that kind of Moorish expulsion and then also at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I want to welcome you to Syracuse and Syracuse University. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for your scholarship um, in this area. My question is I think I know the answer, but I want you to deny or verify. Um, Malcolm X, most people know him as that, but they also know him as. Uh, Malik Shabazz, mm -hmm. but most people have a tendency to believe that Malik Shabazz was the name that he adopted after leaving the Nation of Islam and making his pilgrimage to, to Mecca. Um, and I understand that that's not the case. Um, that he actually yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, I think a, a lot of people use um, Malcolm X when he comes back from Mecca, um, begins, you know, he, he has his name El Hajj, he begins signing his letters that he wrote for Mecca. Al Haj Malik Shabazz. And when he comes back, um, people in the press begin asking him, So, are you, is that how you want to be called, Al Haj Malik Shabazz? And he says, He says a couple to, to answer you. He says, he says, Well, as long as the circumstances that created Malcolm X still exist, I'm going to go by Malcolm X. So he says that. The second thing um, is that uh, you're right, that name, Malcolm, traveled. Uh, in 1959 as an emissary of Elijah Muhammad and on his passport the name was Malcolm Shabazz. So the name Shabazz was one that he had been given uh, while he was in the Nation of Islam and refers to uh, the Nation of Islam's history of the tribe, the name of the tribe of people that Elijah Muhammad taught uh, uh, African Americans were descended from the tribe of Shabazz. And if you go a step further and, and look at what uh, Malik means, it means king. So Malcolm calls himself the king of the tribe of Shabazz. Um, and in the Nation of Islam's historiography, Shabazz is a rebellious uh, figure. Um, and Malcolm was a rebel from his childhood all the way up to, to the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you, you talk about these, this formation of alternative identity. I'm curious, why do you think there was a more interest in re re reviving some of the indigenous African beliefs 
in distinction to Islam, uh, treating Islam as a, as a kind of importation into Africa or imposition on African indigenous beliefs, and then trying to even, you know, go, you think before pre-Islamic influence in Africa to, to, to bring out um, a kind of a way of fighting you know, white supremacy and creating an identity that's purely African to the extent that would be the case. Right. Um, I guess you're referring to like the Afrocentric type movement or the Yoruba traditions when you say, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, much of this was spurred on by the initial, um, a kind of wanting to rebut the argument of, of we were all Muslims, right? Um, that many people began to argue. Um, I think a lot of it is, is a valid, um, uh, reclaiming, and I don't know that it's it's been so much a displacement as it is to really um, appreciate the plurality and the diversity of, of African American religious traditions. So you know, not all Africans were Muslim, um, but I don't know. I mean, there is, you know, Sherman Jackson calls it um, Black Orientalism, and he has this whole thing where he talks about the work of scholars like Chancellor Williams and Destruction of Black Civilization and other Afrocentric scholars to um, you know, discount the role of Islam in, in West Africa um, as something that was, was imposed. Um, but I, I think you know, there's, there's a debate there. there. There's a debate there. I think um, when you look at someone like Ali Masrui, who probably has one of the most respected documentaries on, on Africa, um, the role of Islam, and it's a pretty objective take, um, is by and large a, ben a beneficial role that, that Islam plays at that time in that time period, especially in West Africa. Um, so I don't, I don't see that much of a conflict. Um, I mean, I My think. Question is the value. It's yeah. not a value judgment about yeah. Islam, but it's, I think it's the recognition that historically there was a time when no Africans were Islam. Yeah, no, and I, I, yeah, I think that. Why not go back to that? Why not go back to that? Um, it, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think this was more immediate. I mean, the, you had the convergence of um, the kind of um, uh, you know missionary activities of, of people like the Ahmadiyyas and other people trying to make those connections. Um, you didn't have that so much with um, with the indigenous African religions. And then I will add. Um, the image of Africa at that time period was not a good one. Even the image of Africa held by African Americans, right? Because the Western portrayal of Africa as a land that was savage and uncivilized, in fact, some of this finds, it, finds its way into um, some of the lessons of the Nation of Islam, right? There's, and I don't remember the, the exact, but it's like, why does the devil call our people Africans? Because he wants us to believe that we are the only people we have, and, and right. we're all savage. Exactly. So you know, there was a kind of sense that um, this would not be um, an effective alternative identity. It would not be effective as a social justice movement in that that time period because Africa had been so maligned uh, in the psyche of African Americans that you know, telling them that you're African is not like people are like. I mean, even when I was growing up, you know, there was like the insult was to be called like an African booty scratcher or whatever. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that was, you know, calling some I'm serious, right? Calling someone African was grounds to get in the fight. Thankfully, people have moved beyond that kind of ignorance, but this is only 1980s, right? So imagine what it was 1930. You know, calling someone African was like, please. So that would not have been an effective identity for that project. Yeah, well, this conversation makes me think a lot about Franz, Franz Boas, you know, mm -hmm. the founder of American Anthropology. He went to LA University and gave a lecture with W.B. W. Du Bois about, about African civilization, basically trying to encourage African Americans to reclaim a virtuous African past mm -hmm. in, in contradistinction of scientific racism, which was granted at the time. But so Boas didn't, didn't go back to the Moorish history. He didn't go back to Islam. He, back to some of the indigenous African mm -hmm. beliefs and indigenous African civilizations as a source of pride. But, but, that didn't, but you're suggesting that, that wasn't enough. It would take 50 years or so for that to set in. Yeah. 
Like I think now people would be, the last 20, I think as a result of the Afrocentric movement, people are, are more willing to listen to that. But before that, I mean, people didn't want to be called black, much less African, you know. If I, I might just pick back for a minute, would you also consider the power of Islam um, to transform, the power of Islam to reclaim? I mean, Muhammad was able to use Islam to you know, transform Arabia and then go beyond to make changes. Uh, Africa didn't have that power. At that point, Africa was subdued itself. Yeah. Yeah. So to go back to that did not empower the African American to change. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, something that you touched on um, throughout the presentation that I want to know if you can maybe talk about a little more at length was the uh, contribution that African American Muslims made for the, I guess you can call it immigrant Muslim population in America, like uh, in terms of you know creating an Islamic identity, you know, kind of normalizing it so people are more receptive to it. I think one thing that one dynamic that plays in today's uh, Muslim society is this, I guess, the imitation of the black American Muslims as, okay, well, they, came, they used to be NOI, they used to be Islam, and they had this, they had that, that this false understanding is kind of what, I guess, some people would, would cut or would, would think or believe. But then, um, one thing that you touched on was that even though that it was, I guess, different from like mainstream orthodox Islam, that it, serve the purpose in that, I guess, people today may not know the benefits that they're reaping of because of the struggles and the legacy from, from So I, I just wanted to know if you can like, just talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, in addition to the, the, the kind of stuff that I mentioned, I mean, if you look at, I mean, that, I don't know if you were here when I showed the first slides from, from Glee. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, if you look at the cultural representations of, uh, of Islam, I mean, it's still rooted in the African American tradition. Um, it's still, when people want to kind of identify an American Muslim culturally, it's Muhammad Ali, it's Kareem Abdul Jabbar, it's, you know what I mean? Um, and even, you know, last, last year, the Library of Congress, every year they, uh, take a number of films to become part of the National Film Registry, part of the National Archives, and the film that they accepted, one of the films they accepted last year was Malcolm X, the film by Spike Lee. And it joins Daughters of the Dust, the film clip that I showed, is also part of the National Registry. And I went and looked through the National Registry. There's no other films on this that has any kind of Muslim figure in it, right? And so understanding the like representational power of, of African American Islam for not just African Americans is very key. Not just in terms of the language, but in terms of the culture. Um, the prison ministry that was started by the Nation of Islam uh, led to the prison ministry that many Muslims conduct in the, in the prison systems. Um, many of the early lawsuits that were filed to have prison, uh, the prison system acknowledge of Muslims as a religious uh, group in the prisons, respecting their dietary laws, respecting their Friday worship. They, those lawsuits were filed by members of the Nation of Islam in the 50s, right? And so um, there are many ways, legal, political, cultural, uh, of, of, of ways that the Nation of Islam in particular, but African American Muslims in general, created a space for every everyone to practice Islam. and. You know, that's why I cited this, this, um, this uh, study last year on you know, Islamophobia that found that African Americans were less inclined to the kind of Islamophobic ideas of the rest of the country. Um, that is due to the same kind of groundwork that was done by African American Muslims. And I think what is troubling to me, why I think this is an important, you know, important to point out these, these facts, um, is the discourse, the public discourse on Islam in America seldom includes an African American face, right? Like the spokespersons that are selected by the media are often South Asian or Arab. When, you know, Arabs are made, I think make up less than 20% of the Muslim world, right? South Asians are a little bit more, um, but I think South Asians are about 40% of American Muslims and African Americans are about 40% of 